I want to thank you for joining me again in studying the book of Isaiah. I'll ask, if you will, to go ahead and be turning to chapter 40 as we begin the third and the final section of the book of Isaiah, chapters 40 through 66 is that final section. We saw chapters 1 through 35 and the burdens and the judgments that were portrayed there. We just completed chapters 36 through 39, which was that historical interlude as it related to Assyria and Sennacherib and then, and of course, Hezekiah. And now we're going to be beginning this new section, Comfort for the People of God. Just that very title should tell us that the tone of the message is going to change significantly as we move through the remainder of this section now of the book of Isaiah. The reasons for comfort are portrayed in chapters 40 through 88, uh, chapters 40 through 48, excuse me, as we move through there. And again, we see that dramatic tone and we see that the different tone that is portrayed here is so drastic that this is one of the things that has led to the problem that we addressed way on back when we introduced our study of Isaiah. There's what's called the Deutero or Trito Isaiah theory. Deutero 2, Trito 3. And what that theory presented was that there was more than one man named Isaiah who wrote. Now, it's a theory that we debunked as we move through both the text and historical references. But maybe we can understand now why some have gone to that conclusion. Now, I believe that part of the problem is that many people refuse to believe in the concept of prophecy, predictive prophecy, and its fulfillment. And that might be one reason. But here, I think we can see the tone change being a difference. So if you're looking at those who might believe that because chapters 1 through 35 is of such a different tone than chapters 40 through 66, that that must necessitate the idea that two different men wrote it. I don't think at all that that's the case. But maybe we can understand why people came to that conclusion. At this point, Isaiah now moves beyond the Assyrian threat. That's what was dealt with in chapters 36 through 39 regarding Sennacherib. And we saw God's divine protection of Hezekiah and wiping out the 185,000 troops and Sennacherib's army, he went back home from that point, basically is not heard from again. But Isaiah is moving from that concept now to more of a concept of deliverance. Now, this deliverance is going to be twofold, or there's going to be two beneficiaries of these thoughts and these ideas as it relates to deliverance. First of all, we're going to see the remnant. Any discussion of Babylon cannot exclude Babylonian captivity. But also here, and that's already been addressed to some degree in those first 35 chapters. But now we're even looking beyond Babylonian captivity. And we're going to zero in on the deliverance of the remnant that we've already spoken about as well in so many of the passages as it relates to this study. We know that that deliverance occurred because of the foreign policy shift or a change from the Medo-Persian king Cyrus. He's going to be addressed in chapter 44 and 45. And we're going to see prophecies made that basically were fulfilled when he signed a decree to allow God's people to come home and even footed the bill for a lot of what they were going to accomplish in the three waves of that return. But we're not just talking about Judah, or now we can talk about Israel as a spiritual unity, because remember, as a national unity, there is no more Israel or Judah. Both in Babylonian captivity lost that national distinction. Anytime Israel is used from this point forward, we're going to see it being a reference to the remnant 
but also the church, in a way, is going to be seen as Israel, God's children, in that regard. The concept of the servant of the Lord, quote unquote, servant of the Lord, becomes much more prevalent in this section. And as we move through, and I hope to to be able to, to show you these clearly enough that you can see them, but scholars have identified four so-called servant songs. And in these songs, Isaiah and the Messiah are both referred to as servants. These songs are going to culminate in that great section of this last section of the book, and that is chapter 53, 52, verse 13, excuse me, through chapter 53 and verse 12, the passage we refer to so often as the suffering servant. We see the prophecy of Jesus on the cross, specifically in chapter 53. Messianic passages are more abundant in chapters 40 through 66 than they were in chapters 1 through 35. It's been estimated that there are some 50 verses of chapters 40 through 66 that are quoted in the New Testament. And that's in comparison to about 30 quotes that are found in chapters 1 through 35. We're going to see even more why Isaiah was referred to as the Messianic prophet, a nickname he was given. Many of those 50 quotes that we're going to be looking at, maybe we'll just mention them in reference, and some of those we'll give more attention to. But many of those 50 refer directly to the Messiah or somebody who is closely associated with him and his work. Salvation or deliverance is a major theme. It begins with the announcement of deliverance from Babylonian captivity, and it ends with the promise of salvation, not only for Israel, but we're also going to see for any nation that submitted their own will to God. Now let's stop and drive a peg down here for just a moment. Remember the promise given to Abraham, the seed promise in Genesis chapter 12 in the first several verses. Through your seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Note there that there's no distinction to race. There's no distinction to nationality. Through your seed, all nations of the earth would be blessed. So therefore, we're told very early on that God's plan has always been for everybody who would accept him and submit their will to his. We look at passages such as this, and the very same thing is stated. We look at the minor prophets, Jonah and Nahum, and we see again indications that God is concerned about the Gentiles. In Acts chapter 2, we're going to see 3,000 Jewish people baptized. But then we move to Acts chapter 10, and we see Cornelius and his conversion. And we see a shift from that point. Paul is going to make a very clearly reference shift from the Jews to going to the Gentiles to preach the gospel. I'm saying all of that to say this. The Jews should never have been surprised to learn that the Gentiles were also in God's plan. The Gentiles were always in God's plan. If we can apply Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 to the church, and that is correct. Christ was in the mind of God before the foundation of the world. Then Jew and Gentile, black and white, rich and poor, slave or free, all have always been considered as having an opportunity to come to God. The same is so true for us today. God is not an American God. The church is not an American church. It's universal in the sense that it can be anywhere and anyone who submits their will to God's will can be added to that. And we share the fellowship. We share the the brotherhood 
of so many. There are so many powerful lessons that we're going to see. And we may slow down in some of these passages even more. I know this is taking us a while to get through this study, but if you've been with me through this study, you realize there's a lots of point, many points for us to look at. There's a lot of application to be made in this study together. These themes, salvation and deliverance, refer both to the physical return from captivity and the spiritual blessings that would likewise come from that, but also to the salvation that was a result of the coming of the Messiah, the system in which we still live, the message to which all men are still amenable, the gospel of Jesus Christ, it delivers, it saves. Well, chapter 40, as we now move into the material itself, we see the sovereignty and majesty of God. Let's stop just a moment and look at those two terms. The sovereignty of God talks about his authority. All authority is inherent in him. There is one God, and it's him to whom all men owe their allegiance, to whom all must submit their will. But the majesty of God talks about that, that God is grand, and, and he's beautiful, and he's spectacular. And we see all of this as we see God's work. When we zero in on chapter 44 and we start looking at Cyrus, it's one of my favorite passages in the book of Isaiah because it is so pointed and there's no missing it. Cyrus was referred to by name almost 200 years before he was born. And Isaiah's readers learn that he was going to be God's tool to bring the people back out of captivity. That's the majesty of God to perform something like that. That stands above anything or anyone as it relates to ability. The deliverance is testimony to his power and his majesty. Christ is a testimony to his will and his majesty and his power. Daniel chapter 2 indicates that the God of heaven is going to set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. That is the majesty of God. The power, the awesome nature of God is what's being portrayed. That sovereign majesty is the theme of chapter 40. The power and the authority of his word and the fact that he is in control is made abundantly clear. I don't know of a day ever in my life that it's more important for us to realize even today, especially today, that God is still in control. We're fearful of COVID. We've lost loved ones to COVID. We're looking at a moral shift in this society. We're seeing increased pressure on those who disagree with the moral left in our society. We may be looking forward to days when it's going to be more difficult to be a Christian than it ever has been before. Through all of that, we need not to be those who cower in fear. We need to be those who stand in confidence. Why? Not because of my ability, but because God, the majestic God, the sovereign God, is still in control and all of his promises to care for us and provide for us remain true. Well, let's look at verses 1 through 11. We'll see how much, we'll see if we can get through this section. And this is the incomparable word of God. Let's read together. Comfort. Yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill brought low. 
The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The voice said, Cry out. And he said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, because the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. O Zion, you who bring good tidings, get up into the high mountain. O Jerusalem, you who bring good tidings, lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up, be not afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God shall come with a strong hand, and his arms shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them to his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. Please note again, the first word of this section is comfort, comfort, my people. What a shift in message. What a change in tone from burden to comfort. From condemnation of sin to promise of forgiveness of sin. Oh, what a beautiful message that we see. The opening verses of this chapter may very well be a prologue for the remainder of this book, chapters 40 through 66. The theme from this point on is not judgment, it's restoration, it's return, it's blessings. No human force has ever been or ever will be capable of hindering God's plans or God's promises. When God makes a plan, it's going to come about. When God makes a promise, it's going to be kept. That's confidence that we have. The book of Hebrews makes that so clear. God cannot lie. The immutability of God He's going to follow through. He's not going to change his mind. He's not going to change the method and mode of what he's done. We're not going to have to worry about God telling somebody 30 years from now, if the earth is still here by then, they're not going to get another message. Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, Paul said, if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. Paul, an apostle of God, did not have the authority to alter the message. But God also cannot alter the message because of his character, because of his immutability. And so we can walk through an uncertain world knowing that there are certainties, not because we've deduced them, but because God has proclaimed them and promised them to us. Verses 1 and 2, comfort my people. Again, the main idea of chapters 40 through 48 is comfort. Isaiah writes comforting words for those who are going to be coming back from Babylonian captivity. Remember what they've all faced. They've been in captivity for some 70 years. Their homes likely destroyed. The temple, we know, destroyed. But they're going back and they're having a, they have authority to make that their home again. They have authority and they've been provided for monetarily to rebuild the temple. Ezra is going to come back in a second wave and the law is going to be reinstituted. Nehemiah is going to come back in a third wave. And he's going to see to it that the walls are rebuilt around the city. Their home, their worshiping, they're focusing on the law, they're secure. All of this is what's ahead of them now, and it should be comforting to each and every one. Some form of the word comfort is used 14 times by Isaiah. 12 of those is used in chapters 40 through 66, only two times. Is the word comfort mentioned in chapters 1 through 35? 
but it's mentioned 12 times or 14, excuse me, 12 times through the remainder of the book. God referred to Judah as my people, and he indicated that he would not abandon them. They need to understand that God has never changed his mind regarding them. Remember again the seed promise. Remember the promise made in Genesis 49.10 that the scepter shall not depart from Judah until Shiloh comes. Remember that David was promised in 2 Samuel chapter 7 that God was going to keep that messianic king line pure, and he did. He's going to work through the remnant to bring all of this about. God has not changed his mind regarding the seed promise. God has not changed his mind regarding the promise of a king. And he's not changed his mind regarding the promise he's already made them that the remnant is going to return. Now, let's think about all of this as to when it was said. Isaiah wrote this about 740 B.C. It's going to be 200 years before this promise is fulfilled that the remnant is going to come back. They're told, they're promised, and it's going to happen. Now, the phrase says your God in the Hebrew is in the perfect tense giving the idea that God continues to say you are my people says God but says God in the sense that God hasn't changed his mind the truth that they are his people has not changed and that point is driven home for them to have a basis of comfort. Verse 2, the idea portrayed here is that of speaking kindly to those who are despondent. The word that in verse 2, that her warfare is ended. That's the reason for the comfort. They're going to be carried away in three ways in the captivity. That's also yet future. In many cases, in many ways, they didn't heed the message of Isaiah because they continued in their idolatry. That resulted in the ten northern tribes being carried away. It also resulted in the two southern tribes being carried away. That still is going to come. But there's going to come a time when that's going to end. And that warfare is going to end. And God's going to welcome them back. Yes, they are to have comfort. Verses 3 through 8, the word of the Lord stands forever. Now, here is an interesting thought because it's almost an interlude because he's been talking about captivity and return from captivity of the remnant. But in verses 3 and 4, there is a voice in the wilderness. That voice is not God, and that voice is not Isaiah. Because that voice has a task of preparing the way for the Messiah, the Lord. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. All four gospel accounts quote this passage. And all four of them indicate that it is a reference to John the Baptist, who prepared a way for the Messiah. So see again why we say this is deliverance and salvation for Judah, but it's also in a larger sense and a messianic concept. That's what we see here in this passage. A highway for our God may very well be the highway of holiness that was referred to back in chapter 35 and verse 8. Clyde Woods, in his commentary, says that that highway was a processional way, like those prepared for the great kings of antiquity. Verse 4 amplifies verse 3 
by giving a description of the work done in preparation for the coming king. Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough places smooth. Verse 5 references the glory of the Lord. And that again is one of the most important concepts of Isaiah as well as the entire Bible. Ezekiel described the departure of the Lord's glory from the temple and from Jerusalem. That's in Ezekiel's chapters 9 through 11, roughly. Ezekiel, remember, prophesied from Babylon being taken in that second wave. And he was talking about the glory of the Lord's been taken. The temple's going to be destroyed. Remember, for the Jews, the temple is where God dwelt. Seventy years in the wilderness, and they're not going to have that place they can look at and understand that God is between the cherubim on the mercy seat, the lid to the Ark of the Covenant. That's not there. From the time of the Exodus to the point they were carried away into captivity, they either had the tabernacle, which had a most holy place with the Ark of the Covenant in it, or there was the temple built by Solomon that's about to be destroyed in 586 in that third and final wave going into Babylonian captivity. They have never been in a situation, therefore, where there was not a place that they did not see that God was with them. And now they're in captivity, and they don't have that. The synagogue was born. They did some worship. But now the going back and that temple is going to be built again. And the temple is going to represent God dwelling with them. The church is going to recommend God dwelling with us today. Verses 6 through 8, that which is temporary is compared with what is permanent. There's several passages. We don't have the time to read them. You might jot down 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 24 and 25, and James chapter 1, verses 10 and 11. Both of those indicate that some things are temporary and some things are permanent in nature. The, tempor the, the, the temple was temporary. It was destroyed in 586. It was destroyed again not to be rebuilt in 70 AD. But God dwelling with man never ceased. That's always permanent. And those who are found faithful will be with him for eternity. Dwelling with God. Quickly, verses 9 through 11, here is your God. Do not fear is a phrase that is repeated often in the next few chapters. The good news is to be proclaimed to the people of God. The central point of the message is that God has not abandoned his people and you can trust him. That point is made throughout the book. As a matter of fact, I believe the central theme of Isaiah is trust in God, not man. In numerous ways, that's told over and over again. Don't trust in idols. Don't trust and alliances with man. Don't trust in your own thoughts and ideas. Isaiah 55, God's thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts higher than our thoughts. We can't think like God can think. We just need to put our trust in him. They were to look at him, not their own abilities, not to their alliances with the surrounding nations, not to the false prophets. The phrase in verse 10 about God's arm refers to his strength and a power to accomplish his purposes. That's that anthropomorphic language. God has given human qualities so that we can understand. What better way to understand power than to look at one's arm and the muscle in one's arm, especially those who have lifted weights and they've bulked up the arm of the Lord. That power is what's being portrayed. That imagery is used often during the Exodus, and it was the arm of the Lord that finally delivered them. I only have a few seconds. Verse 11, Isaiah turns from power and authority to a tone of tenderness and compassion. Here you have a figure of the shepherd 
with his flock and the tender care of his people. Think about Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. That's one of the more powerful references to that, to that fact. But we also see passages such as John chapter 10, verses 11 through 14. The same arm that signified military strength is also used to gather his people in mercy. Well, our time is up for today. Thank you for joining us again. We'll pick back up there in verse 12 next time. And until then, God bless you.